Because one thing I've learned is this, in politics and in combat, cowardice is contagious, but so is courage. And if you're willing to be the first person over those ramparts, you will be shocked at how many people will come with you. I'm asking you to come with me. I'm asking you to be a part of the generation that will restore the promise of this country and breathe new life into it. Hi, and welcome to Making the Argument with Nick Freitas. Today, we are going to be going over criminal justice and police reform. So obviously, this is an issue that has come up a lot lately. It's something that we see state legislatures all across the country dealing with. The federal government is also taking different measures in order to achieve better justice within our criminal justice system and more efficiency and effectiveness within our law enforcement organizations across the country. Once again, I want to remind everybody that this is a special podcast series that we are doing. So if you do have questions that you would like us to address as we go through these various topics from now until Election Day on November 3rd, please go to podcast.nick4va.com. You'll see within the menu there's a schedule button. You go ahead and click on that. It'll show you the various podcasts, the various issues that we're going to be addressing. You can go through there. You can submit questions, and we'll make sure that we address them as we're going through the various problems and the proposed solutions on how to actually address issues that are important to you. So let's start off with police reform. There's been a lot of things that have been put forward lately on the best way to get an effective and efficient police force that is responsive to the communities that they're serving. And we're going to talk about some of the various suggestions that have been put forward and what my position is on those and the reasons why I think the way I do about these individual issues. So the first thing that I want to address has to do with no-knock warrants. So this is something that you've seen a lot of people from across the political spectrum saying that we've got to either rein in or completely get rid of no-knock warrants. So what a no-knock warrant is, is essentially just how it sounds. When the police go to serve a warrant, they do not have to give you any advance nor, uh, notice before they serve it. And there's been a lot of people saying that like this leads to a lot of problems. We've had issues before where, you know, because there was no advance notice before the police entered the room uh, or came in what they call kinetically or came in very, very, uh, you know, violently, uh, that both innocent people and uh, officers can get hurt in this process. I mean, you can imagine a situation where the police are coming through to serve a warrant. Maybe they have the wrong location or, uh, you know, maybe someone else is in the room that has nothing to do with the person that they're actually trying to apprehend. And those people can obviously get hurt as the police are coming through the door. A lot of times they'll use what you, again, call a kinetic breach. They might shotgun the door, they might kick in the door, they might ram the door in order to come in and get the suspect as quickly as possible. Now, a lot of people, again, look at this and think, look, this is just way too aggressive, way too violent. Is there really any need for no-knock warrants? Shouldn't the police have to at least give you some sort of, you know, warning, knock on the door, you know, loudspeakers, police open up before they enter a structure in order to get somebody? And here's the thing I want to I want to lay out, right? Because I, I think a lot of these issues are not so much left and right as they are, you know, reasonable and in some cases unreasonable. So I do think that there is a place for no-knock warrants. And let me give you an example of this. My father was LAPD for 20 years, and he told me a story about how before he came on to the department, they had a situation where LAPD needed to go and serve a warrant. And it wasn't just on one person. It was on multiple people. Uh, and they knew they were violent. It was gang activity. They knew they were armed. Uh, but they didn't have the ability to do a no-knock warrant. So they literally had to take an officer and strap him from head to toe with body armor prop him up to the door to where he could knock and say, police, we have a warrant. Well, as soon as he knocked on the door, bullets start come streaming through the door. Officers hit multiple times. You know, other officers were hit trying to retrieve this person before they could then go in and serve the warrant and collect the people that they were trying to apprehend. I think in situations like that where you have an extreme situation where you know it's going to be a, a violent um, situation, and not only can the officers potentially get hurt, but neighbors can get hurt through stray bullets and rounds going in other directions or through the wall and into the neighbor's house or to somebody else. So I, I do think that there are times where a no-knock warrant can be appropriate. The problem that we've had, though, is that a lot of the no-knock warrants that are being issued right now are not being issued because there's an extreme threat to the officer or the safety of innocent people within the vicinity. They're being issued so 
evidence can be collected before it can be flushed down the toilet or before it can be destroyed. And as much as I sympathize with the police officer wanting to be able to get in there and get the evidence that they need, we have to do a, a trade-off here. There's, there's a balancing act that comes with law enforcement and the decisions that are being made. So I think when you have a situation where um, you know the, the suspect is violent, you know the suspect is armed, uh, you're relatively sure that there's nobody else in the home with the suspect, and police, for the safety of themselves and for the safety of neighbors and anybody else that might be in the area need to go in and serve a warrant, then I, I think giving the bad guy an advance notice at this point is probably not the best course of action for the safety of the officers that, or the people in the surrounding area. So I, I do think that in those areas there can be reasonable uh, cases where a no-knock warrant is appropriate. However, getting a no-knock warrant uh, you know, approved by a judge, right now I think the it's over 90% of the no-knock warrants are automatically approved. Um, you know, and a lot of these are, again, it, it's, to, it's to maintain evidence as opposed to deal with safety issues. And so I, I think we need some reform within, with respect to when no-knock warrants can be issued. Um, so I, I wouldn't support getting rid of them completely, but I would support pretty significant reform to say that it needs to be done uh, for safety issues, not just for issues of, of evidence collection. Another issue I want to go into has to do with qualified immunity. This is another one that a lot of people have advocated getting rid of completely. So what is qualified immunity? Qualified immunity was a legal precedent that was set in the 1960s. And essentially what it said is that as long as an officer was diligently trying to carry out their duties and was operating under the impression that they were carrying out their duties appropriately, but they weren't violating anyone's constitutionally protected rights or they're engaging in any sort of neglect or abuse of power, then they can't be sued as an individual for trying to carry out the law and do their job. And this was, again, to protect law enforcement individuals, not just the cities or the department, but individuals from frivolous lawsuits that you can all imagine would come up if all of a sudden every attorney out there knew that anytime there was an interaction with the police that a citizen didn't like, they could sue the officer directly. Right. So I, I think that's an appropriate, or I think that's a, a reasonable um, you know, reason for why they wanted to set up qualified immunity in the first place. Unfortunately, officers have gotten away for, for with doing things that I think you could easily come in and say that was either a neglect or it was out of policy or it was potential abuse of power. So everyone from Justice Clarence Thomas to people on the left have all said, we need to reevaluate qualified immunity. We need to tighten the language. And when we say tighten the language, we just simply mean there needs to be clear left and right limits. What exactly is covered by qualified immunity and what is not? So we we don't want to create a situation where essentially nobody wants to be a police officer because obviously when your job is to go out and deal with people that are breaking the law and sometimes violently breaking the law, you don't want to be constantly second guessing, gosh, if I get in a fight with this person, am I going to end up you know, being sued in civil court for simply carrying out my duties? Right? That, that's a reasonable concern by law enforcement officers. And I think we also need to understand as the public that is supposed to be being served by these officers. We want them to show up. If you call somebody because they're robbing you at their house or they're threatening you and you call the police, you want them to show up in time to stop the person or prevent the person from harming you. But if a police officer has to look at it from the perspective of, if I get there in time and there's an altercation or somebody gets hurt because I am diligently trying to carry out my duties as a police officer and I'm going to get sued for that, well, it's a whole lot easier to just drive a little bit slower to where the incident is taking place and fill out a report, right? That is not, that is a perverse incentive that we don't want our men and women in blue having to deal with. So don't get rid of qualified immunity altogether, but certainly reform it to where we don't have issues of abuse or we don't have issues of neglect, or when we have police departments that have to be a little bit more careful with respect to the policy they develop, especially when it comes to using things like deadly force or using uh, violent force, so that we ensure that it, it is serving the purpose it was meant to provide, which is you know, we don't want officers not showing up to a violent situation or a violent altercation because they're afraid of getting sued all the time for simply trying to carry out their duties. But we don't cover neglect, abuse, or some other form of dereliction of duty, right? So again, let's, let's reform qualified immunity. Let's make the language a little bit tighter. Let's ensure that it doesn't cover those things that we don't want it to cover. But by the same token, let's not create a perverse incentive where now we have a police department that doesn't act, is too afraid to get involved in violent situations or to actually enforce the law because of them being personally sued and losing everything as a result.
Next one I want to go over it has to do with trauma and what we call trauma-informed or mental illness-informed training for law enforcement officers. So you've seen a lot of people lately saying that, well, you know, the police get called because there's a homeless person out front. They shouldn't call the police. They should call a social worker. All right, well, that sounds good, but the problem, and there, and there may be appropriate times for that, but if you're sending a social worker to somewhere al alone by themselves without a police escort, you're now coming into a situation where uh, something could go and, and it looks normal or it looks like this is just someone that needs help and the next thing you know they turn violent as a result of mental illness or maybe some sort of drug-induced um, you know, psychosis. We, we still need law enforcement to be able to deal with these situations, right? It doesn't mean that there's no room for social work in there, but we still need law enforcement to show up to a situation that could potentially turn violent for the safety of everyone involved. Now, for the safety of the suspect, one of the things that we can do is do more what they call, again, trauma-informed or mental illness-informed training for law enforcement officers. And that has to do when a law enforcement officer shows up to a scene and someone is unresponsive. It could be because they have violent intention, or it could be that for some sort of mental illness reason, they simply don't understand the instructions. And the more information that law enforcement officers have about how a particular mental illness or, or drugs can affect someone's behavior, the better equipped they are to actually de-escalate the situation. So when we're talking about increased training, and increased access to that training for law enforcement officers, I do think this is an area where your local, state, and your federal government can actually provide training or funding for training for that purpose so that officers can get certified and they can be better equipped when they show up to a scene in order to de-escalate a situation for someone that really doesn't have a negative or ill intent with respect to their behavior, but they are struggling from something perhaps caused by an uh, uh, addiction, perhaps caused by mental illness, and let's, let's equip our officers to be able to better address that. Another thing that we want to be able to do has to do with policing for profit. So what this has to do is everyone that has gotten pulled over by a state trooper or a highway patrol and gotten a ticket uh, has thought to themselves, am I getting pulled over and am I getting this ticket because this is a way that the local sheriff or the state troopers actually fund their own police budget. So one of the ways that you avoid this is that you create a situation where when law enforcement has to enforce a law, you don't want the department profiting off of that because now you've created a perverse incentive to rigorously enforce the law in a way that might not have been intended by the legislators who wrote the bill in the first place. So for instance, here in Virginia, when state troopers write you a speeding ticket, that does not go into the state troopers' budget. It actually goes to the literacy fund. Right? We have other issues that we've passed. For instance, for three years, I carried bills on civil asset forfeiture reform. If you're, not, if you're not familiar with civil asset forfeiture, what it essentially means is the government can confiscate your property. So let's say you loan your car to your uncle and you think your uncle's gonna go to a job interview, but instead your uncle decides to traffic heroin, <laughs> right? He gets pulled over, the car gets seized along with the heroin. That car can now be sold by the police department and the police department can actually use those funds for their own budget. Right now, there's two problems here. The first problem is you had your property confiscated by the government and sold and forfeited, and you never committed a crime. The second problem is the police now have an incentive to take your property and sell it because it adds to their budget. Now, we need to make sure that our law enforcement agencies are properly funded through tax dollars, right? That is a legitimate function of government, and that is a legitimate use of tax dollars. But we shouldn't be creating this policing for profit perverse incentive, which encourages law enforcement to go out and seize property, forfeit it so they can get those funds. Now, one of the biggest um, problems with this has to do with the federal level. Again, we got that bill passed here in, this, in the Commonwealth of Virginia, and so we're going through that reform where your property can still be seized, but they have to demonstrate that you are actually a part of the criminal act. You need to be convicted of wrongdoing or sign a plea agreement before they can take your property and forfeit it. Unfortunately, what happens in a lot of cases is federal law enforcement agencies come in and they engage in a joint task force with a local department or a state agency. And then when the federal government seizes the property because they operate off of different laws, they can then give a portion of those proceeds to the local department. So again, that perverse incentive still exists. So civil asset forfeiture reform is something that we need to pass at the federal level as well. Now, I want to be very clear about something. If, you, if someone is engaged in criminal activity and they've profited from that criminal activity, that is fine. That is what we call a criminal forfeiture situation. I want the government, I want law enforcement to be able to seize ill-gotten gains. I want them to be able to seize resources that were used by someone to engage in criminal activity. But you need to have due process of law, right? We can't skip that step.
So when we're talking about criminal asset forfeiture, I have no problem with that. I think that is a legitimate law enforcement function. But when it comes to civil asset forfeiture, we need to reform that so we turn it into criminal asset forfeiture, not civil asset forfeiture. And that's another thing, that's legislation that I will be happy to carry uh, once I'm in Congress. The last thing I want to talk about is kind of wrapping a lot of this up into what sort of police force do we want? So we can talk about no-knock warrants. We can talk about qualified immunity. We can talk about trauma and, and mental illness illness informed training for law enforcement officers, policing for profit, all of those are good, but those are essentially tactical changes, right? What's the strategic change we want to make to the way that we conduct law enforcement in this country to be more effective? And that's where we get into the whole issue of community-based policing. So in the 70s, you started to see this real push for what they called consolidation. And what consolidation was is that they would take a lot of smaller departments within a larger area and they would consolidate it into one large metropolitan police department. And the idea behind that was, well, we're gonna, it's more efficient. It's what you call economies of scale. And if you really wanna dig into this, Eleanor Ostrom, who was the first woman to win the Nobel Prize for economics, has done a lot of work in the whole consolidation mo uh, movement. And she really did a good statistical analysis of has the consolidation movement actually been better for taxpayers? Has it been better for the communities that are serviced by these law enforcement agencies? And she's come to the conclusion that no, the, the data is not in to support the wide, say, say, the wide um, scale consolidation that we've seen. Now, think of it this way. Think of a, a huge metropolitan area like Los Angeles or Washington, D.C. There might be you know, some services that you want to consolidate. So for instance, if you have a lot of smaller departments and they can't afford the more expensive labs for DNA testing and things like that, there's no reason why multiple departments, multiple smaller departments can't pool their resources and have a lab which services all of those uh, individual departments, right? That, that's fine. You could also have things like SWAT teams or, or special uh, specialized units that really deal with high crimes or, or um, uh, high threat situations or terrorism. These are all things that smaller departments can work together in order to come up with, again, good economies of scale, um, different organizations that are only going to be used for very, very specific purposes. They can then service multiple departments. But that doesn't mean that you have to consolidate all the individual departments themselves. Because if you really look at a lot of the work that law enforcement does on a day-to-day -day basis, it needs to be very interactive with the community and you have to be able to foster those close community relationships. And the only way that you're going to do that is that if you have officers that are very familiar with the beats that they're walking, with the communities that they're serving. You need to have different uh, civilian organizations that are willing to work and have those discussion with law enforcement in the area, not only to make sure that information sharing is going on, but also to set priorities. One of the things that we need more of in this country is civilian organizations, civic groups that represent the community that's being served by law enforcement to be engaged in setting what the community priorities should look like, right? That's not a conversation that should just take place with law enforcement agencies or politicians. It's something that needs to take place with those civic leaders within those organizations, those community leaders, so that we can identify what does good law enforcement look for a particular community. And the important thing to understand here is this is not something that the federal government can wave a magic wand on. And the federal government's even tried to do this, where they've tried to incentivize community policing. And unfortunately, what they ended up doing was creating this one-size-fits-all version of what community policing looks like. Obviously, the laws need to be enforced equitably across the board, but we really need to make sure that law enforcement agencies feel like they're getting their marching orders from the, the communities that they're actually serving, not just politicians at the local level or at the state level or at the federal level, right? We really need a partnership between the community and the law enforcement agency. And that's not really something you can legislate, but there are various things that you can do to encourage it. And I think one of the things that we need to do at the federal level is there are certain training dollars that can be allocated specifically for community policing purposes, but again, it shouldn't come with a bunch of strings attached that force local departments to operate in a certain way in order to get the funds. It needs to be more about fostering those close community uh, relationships. So again, if you're really interested in more law enforcement reform, I would really encourage you to look at some of Eleanor Ostrom's work that she's done. I think it's very valuable. And, and here's the, the thing I, I really want to end with on this particular segment. I grew up in a law enforcement family. Uh, I mean, I watched how my father you know, would leave at two o'clock in the morning because there'd been a murder and, and he was a homicide detective and, and he would go there and, and he poured himself in 
to making sure that justice was done for that victim and for that victim's family. And he did it so well that at his retirement, it was the first time any of his fellow officers could ever remember the family of victims showing up to his retirement to personally thank him. They actually presented him with a ring with the birthstones of every, it was two little girls and, and the sister of the woman that showed up. Um, so her nieces and, and her sister who had been murdered by someone that my father and his partner found, they built a good case and they ensured that he was serving consecutive life sentences as a result of his actions. So I just want to say I'm enormously appreciative for the hard work that men and women in blue do every day within this country. And I think it's important for us to understand that when men and women are engaging in those situations, when they are called at a moment's notice to show up to a volatile situation and they have to make split second decisions, I think we need to have a little bit of grace for how difficult that is. I've never done it in law enforcement, but I have done it in the military. And I can tell you it is incredibly stressful, not just because you're worried about what will happen to you. And in fact, in many cases, that's your last concern, but you're terrified of what's going to happen to another innocent third party that could be around the scene. You're really terrified about what it's going to mean for your partner if you don't make the right decision. And so I, I think we do need to have a little bit of grace for how difficult that is and a little bit of patience for our, our men and women in law enforcement. Now that does not mean that we display any patience or any grace for a law enforcement officer that abuses their power. There was nothing my father despised more than someone that abused their power as a law enforcement officer because he saw that as a violation of a sacred trust that they had violated violated between themselves and the communities they were serving. So there is so much room for agreement and broad-based discussion in here between the community, between law enforcement, between legislators, in order to make sure that we are providing the sort of police departments, the sort of sheriff's offices that are really focused around making their community a safer place. <laughs>Right, now we're going to shift gears a little bit and we're going to go into criminal justice reform. And the reason why I separated these out between police reform and criminal justice reform is while they are inextricably linked, there are some very, very marked differences. Police reform is really focused around how do we make for better departments and ensure that the people that are enforcing the laws are doing so in a manner that is just and efficient and effective in order to make sure that we have safe communities. Criminal justice reform deals a little bit more with, you know, what sort of things should be illegal, what sort of punishment should we have? What sort of rehabilitation should we have? And how do we make sure that our criminal justice system does essentially three things? One, it protects innocent people and it ensures justice for victims. Two, it ensures that our law enforcement agencies are well aware of the laws that they have to enforce and do so in a just fashion. And then three, punishment and rehabilitation. And, and it's interesting because you'll see a lot of people talk about restorative justice. So they'll talk about um, you know, rehabilitation, not punishment. Bottom line is there is a rehabilitative component to punishment. And punishment is not in and of itself a bad thing. If you have violently harmed another person, punishment is appropriate because you need to understand that what you did had an effect, sometimes a lasting, sometimes a lifelong lasting effect on another human being. And punishment is a part of the rehabilitative process. Now, of course, we also want to create a situation where we reduce recidivism or the recurrence of people violating the law, getting out, violating the law again, and going right back into incarceration. And there's different ways that we can address that. But the first thing I want to do, I want to lay out is what I see as kind of an ideal situation with respect to how we address criminal justice reform. And that starts off with what I call the, the three-tier approach. So the first tier within a what I believe to be a just criminal justice system is this. If you have broken the law, you have created a victim, and you have used violence, so think of murder, think of rape, Think of child molestation. Uh, think of uh, you know brutal forms of assault. If you have done that, incarceration is the appropriate response to that. If you have been given your day in court, you've been afforded due process of law, and you have been found guilty of one of these heinous crimes where someone has used violence against an innocent person, then yes, incarceration is appropriate because you have demonstrated that you are willing to use violence in order to achieve your ends. And as a result, we need to separate you from peaceful society so people can continue to run their businesses, work jobs, send their kids to school, and not have to live in fear based off of what that person might do in the future. 
So incarceration in those situations is appropriate. And I will tell you right now, there are people, some people think I'm hard on crime, some people think I'm soft on crime. I like to think, no, I'm reasonable on crime. And when you commit that sort of crime, I'm sorry, but the punishment needs to be something that not only separates you from society, but also brings you to full awareness of the pain you have caused another human being. And so I think incarceration is a good option and the appropriate option for someone that has committed a violent act and, and created a victim in the process. The second tier has to do with someone that has created a victim but did not use violence in the process. This could be anywhere as simple as you know theft or burglary or vandalism. But it can also include things like what Bernie Madoff did. You know, Bernie Madoff, you see a lot of people say, well, why are we putting people in jail for nonviolent crimes? Well, when Bernie Madoff stole the life savings of thousands, if not you know, millions of people, or affected their uh, millions of people, that was a significant crime. You might, someone that commits an assault, an assault and battery can be as simple as pushing someone in a bar, right, or getting in a fight in a bar. That's assault and battery. That's a violent crime. But I look at that very differently than I do someone that, you know, just deprive thousands of people of their life savings. That person destroyed lives. And so we need to be, again, reasonable in the way that we look at how the crime, how criminal law affects these various people and, and how it addresses them. So if somebody has created you know, what they sometimes call blue collar crime or whatnot, and it has created a lot of victims, the emphasis should be on restitution to the victims. A lot of times you'll hear the, the um, saying, have they paid their debt to society? Well, generally what we mean when they say that is, have they served prison time? Have they paid their court fees? And look, prison time might be appropriate in certain situations within this tier, and uh, paying court fines might be appropriate as well. But I think the number one concern that we should have for someone that is not necessarily a threat to society in the sense that they're violent. But they have clearly demonstrated that they're willing to hurt other people financially or in other ways through intimidation or whatever it might be. Restitution of the victim should be our number one priority. Before the state gets a dime from that person, we need to make sure that whoever they victimize is made whole to the degree that we have it within our power to do so. And so I think restitution of victim is one of the most important things that we need to reorganize within our criminal justice system so that we are, we are putting uh, the most important person within this exchange first, and that is the victim or the victim's family. And that's why I think on that second tier, sometimes incarceration might be appropriate, sometimes incarceration might not be appropriate. Sometimes you might need a situation where someone is um, not serving time in jail, uh, but they still are on probation or they still have to meet with a probation officer. You can have various things where you see like the ankle bracelets and things like that where it's monitoring. So they haven't, they're not completely free, but I want that person having to engage in productive labor. I don't want them just sitting in a prison cell somewhere soaking up more tax dollars, I want them to have to actually work in order to pay back the victims that they've created through their actions. So tier one, violent crime, someone has been you know, hurt, murdered, uh, that incarceration is the appropriate thing with restitution of victim as the primary concern. Tier two, incarceration is optional. It depends on, on whether or not that person is a flight risk. It depends on whether or not that person can best serve restitute their, their responsibility to their victim from inside a jail cell or from outside a jail cell. The third tier that uh, I address has to do with a crime that has been committed, so a law has been broken, but no victim has been created. And, and a lot of times you see things like that within drugs, within addiction. Um, if no victim has been created, there's two things that we have to look at. One is, is, is has a law really been broken? Has, has something so you know, morally egregious been done that a, a law is required in this situation? And sometimes the answer to that question is yes, and sometimes it might be no. But I think one of the first things that we need to reevaluate is how many laws we have on the book and how many different ways people can run afoul and end up in jail or end up in, a, in a serious consequences as, as a result of their actions. But what I want to specifically address now is when a crime has been committed and it is, it is a legitimate law, they shouldn't have done it, how do we address this? I don't think incarceration is a good answer in those situations. I think, again, there's plenty of ways to do remote monitoring. There's plenty of ways to do things like probation. But again, if someone has not created a victim, they haven't engaged in a violent act, I don't think incarceration is appropriate under those circumstances. Um, in some cases, addiction recovery might be the best course of action. We have a real problem right now, and our law enforcement will be the first to tell you, we're not going to arrest ourselves out of addiction issues. right? We need to have more situations where people can get the help that they need. Sometimes that includes leaving the community that they're currently in, where you have a lot of the triggers that uh, 
cre helped create the bad habit in the first place and now sustains or maintains the bad habit as a result. Sometimes people have to be removed and put into a different situation where they can actually get away from those issues that, that create the bad habits that have led to the addiction or other problems uh, or, or run-ins with the law. But I think that one of the things that we could do, instead of spending money on the incarceration, we can spend money in our criminal justice system to deal with things like addiction recovery, like long-term care that is going to create a far better return on the community's investment, the taxpayer's investment, in order to make sure that we have safer communities. So that's the three-tier system, and it, and it addresses a little bit about when I think incarceration is appropriate, when I don't think incarceration is appropriate. The other thing that I want to talk about here has to do with a pathway to expungement. So it's important important to understand that when we over legislate, and this is one of the things that I always stress, you see a lot of politicians that when a situation goes down that looks really bad on TV, politicians are sometimes the first to throw law enforcement under the bus, but they never go back and actually evaluate are they in this situation because of a law that they passed or that they voted for? If you look at the situation with Eric Garner up in New York, um, he died as a result of an altercation with the police. They'd put him in a chokehold, which there are safe ways to actually apply a chokehold, but he died because, from what I understand, there was other uh, pre-existing conditions associated with it. But the whole law that he was violating in the first place was he was selling cigarettes on the black market. And I don't mean truckfuls of cigarettes. I'm talking about he was selling single cigarettes. Now, why was there even a market for this when you can go legally buy cigarettes anywhere? Because the politicians in New York City raised the taxes so much on tobacco products within New York City that they created a black market. A lot of politicians live in this fairy tale world where they think that just because they make something a law, everything just, you know, reality bends to their will. That's not how it happens. Different people react differently to the law. And when you pass a law that many people think is unjust or inappropriate, they generally have an easier time violating that law, especially when there's money to be made for violating the law. And when you create a black market for something like cigarettes, you're going to have people to violate the law in the first place. I mean, it was perfectly appropriate to reevaluate how that officer handled that situation. But another thing that would have been nice is for politicians to reevaluate the laws they put on the books. And one of the things I've asked my colleagues to, to consider is that every time they make something a law, they are saying that their idea is so important that it requires law enforcement to go out and potentially use violence in order to enforce it. And one of the things I like to say is if your idea is so good, why don't people, why can't you get people to voluntarily cooperate with it? Now, we understand there's some people that will not do that. There's some people that will violate the law. They have ill intent and it's perfectly appropriate to make laws in order to prevent that behavior and punish it if they engage in it anyways. But there's a lot of other things that politicians do, which just has to do with this nanny state of trying to organize society in a way that they think would be more preferable. And that is also destructive. So we need to actually look at over-criminalization. And, and one of the best things, ways that I think we can address this has to do with a bill that Congressman Chip Roy has called Count the Crimes. There was an excellent book that was put out that said three felonies a day. And what the author essentially did is he looked at state, local, and federal law, and he said that a average, well-meaning, good citizen could commit up to three felonies a day without even knowing it, without even really creating a victim. When you look at all of the plethora of federal regulations, local laws, state laws that are on the books. And so I think Chip Roy is taking a great first step in saying, look, we need to have a, a complete list of all the different federal crimes out there and what sort of corresponding punishments are associated with those crimes so that we can go and look and we can do a good evaluation and say, look, is this really something that someone needs to get a fee for, a fine for? Is it really something someone needs to be in jail over? And I think once we have that list and once we force the federal government to actually go and provide that, we have a much better opportunity to reform in a way that is going to lead to less overcriminalization. Now, when someone has violated the law, they've served their time, they've paid restitution of their victim, and they have really demonstrated that they have been rehabilitated, we need to start looking at expungement for certain crimes. Now, again, if you've committed a murder, if you've committed a rape, child molestation, I'm sorry, I don't think there should be a path to expungement in those cases. You committed a heinous crime and, and you have affected someone for the rest of their life, in some case ending their life, and I don't think expungement is appropriate in the more heinous cases like that. However, when we're talking about other crimes, especially certain things like drug violations, 
Um, I, I do think once someone has demonstrated that they are perfectly ready to reenter society and be a productive member, they, they you know, don't intend to break the law, I think there needs to be an easy pathway to where we can expunge that record. Because one of the problems that we have right now is that if you commit a felony, and, and again, you can get a felony for having half an ounce of marijuana in some places in this country. Right? That felony takes away your voting rights. It takes away your ability to own a firearm. Um, I, I talked to one woman that when she was young, and, and I mean like 18, 19 years old, she got in with a bad crowd, she wrote bad checks, but because of the amounts and the number of them, and it wasn't a, a huge number, she had a felony as a result, and she had to go through a very long and arduous process, you know, years and years after the fact, after she had served her time and paid her debt to society and victims to fight to get her gun rights back, to get her voting rights back. I, I think there needs to be a better way where we can acknowledge that sometimes people make a bad decision. And you know what? I'm not going to absolve them of responsibility for that bad decision. But I think as a society, we can recognize when someone has gotten past that point in their life, paid restitution, and now is ready to be a full citizen. Because when you have that felony and you're trying to get a job or you're trying to improve yourself and every door is shut to you or many doors are shut to you as a result, it actually drives people to go back into the same destructive behavior that they engaged in before. And so I do think a pathway to record expungement is appropriate in some cases, and we need to expand how we actually do that, both at the state level and at the federal level. So these are just a, a couple of the things that I think we can do. And just to kind of reiterate as a summary of our police reform and our criminal justice reform, when it comes to the police, let's reform no-knock warrants so that we don't have a situations going on where innocent people are being hurt. When it comes to qualified immunity, we need to tighten the language. We need to take that left limit and that right limit, and we need to make sure that every officer understands that, yes, diligently carrying out your duties in a situation shouldn't land you in court every five seconds because some attorney wants to try to make a quick buck. By the same token, if you engage in neglect, abuse of power, qualified immunity is not there to protect that officer. When it comes to trauma and mental uh, illness informed training, this is something that state and federal governments can provide additional resources so that different police departments and officers can go to different training camps, become train the trainer, go back to their department, and you know, just provide additional information on how to recognize something that is going on when it's a result of addiction, result of mental illness, how to de-escalate the situation so we don't have a violent altercation. It doesn't mean that every situation is going to be effectively de-escalated, but the more we can equip our officers to do it effectively, the better. Policing for profit. We need to look for ways to actually remove those perverse incentives which causes law enforcement to enforce the law, not because it's making the community safer, but because it's adding to their budgets. Civil asset forfeiture reform is one of the key ways to be able to do that at the federal level. And then finally, when it comes to community policing, some of this comes from just the federal government staying out of the way. Stop coming up with a bunch of local task force that draw local resources away from community uh, concerns and reprioritizes federal concerns. That doesn't mean that there's no role for a federal and state or local task force. Sometimes there is. But we need to make sure that community-based police departments are focused on the priorities that the community has developed in conjunction with that department, not priorities that have been, have been developed by some faraway legislature either at the state or the federal level. So let's do a quick summary of some of the things that we've gone over, and then we're going to also address some of the questions that we receive. So when it comes to police reform, again, we need reform for things like no-knock warrants and qualified immunity. I think uh, a lot of us, there's a lot of widespread agreement that some of these things have gotten out of hand, and we need to tighten the language so that a no-knock warrant is used in specific situations where the police officers or people, innocent people in the community might be affected um, that might be an appropriate place for a no-knock warrant. But I, again, I think it's gotten out of hand. I think far too many of them are being approved at this point, not because of safety concerns, but because of other concerns. When it comes to qualified immunity, again, we do not want to create a situation where every police officer feels like they're going to get sued every time they do a traffic stop. So we need to make sure that officers know that they can carry out their duties, and that as long as they're doing so in an honest manner, in accordance with the law, um, then they're not going to wind up and losing their home because some you know attorney decided to make a quick buck by constantly suing individual officers. That creates a perverse incentive that we are not going to like if we do that. But we do need to reform qualified immunity because qualified immunity is not supposed to cover negligence or abuse of power. And so if we can clean up that language, I think we can find a good compromise that is going to protect our officers and protect our communities better. When it comes to trauma and mental informed uh, training for officers, that is one area 
area where your state governments, your federal government, should invest more money in, in, in improving the training quality and availability to our officers. And it doesn't mean that every officer has to come to a federal school. A lot of times you come there, you can get trained the trainer programs and you can move that down. But this is also something that should be a community-based uh, approach because different communities are going to face different issues at different levels and different degrees than other communities. And we should allow those communities to work, or we should allow those law enforcement agencies to work in conjunction with the community to prioritize the training that works best for them. Policing for profit, again, it's a problem and it is a problem at the federal level. Things like civil asset forfeiture will go a long way in order to ensure that we are not creating perverse incentives where officers are enforcing the law, not because it makes the community safer, but because it, it uh, boosts their budget, right? We need to properly fund law enforcement agencies with tax dollars in order to ensure that there aren't these perverse incentives through policing through profit schemes. And then finally, when it comes to the overall consolidation movement, the federal government needs to stop pushing local departments to prioritize federal concerns over local concerns. And again, there's not a, there's not a bill that you're going to pass that's going to achieve this, it's more about sometimes the federal government just getting out of the way and not doing things like uh, overemphasizing these federal task force which pull local officers away from community concerns in order to prioritize federal concerns because they're going to get money from civil asset forfeiture or things of that nature. That doesn't mean that there's never an appropriate case for a joint task force between federal, state, and local. Sometimes there are, but when it comes to prioritizing, let local departments focus on community concerns, and when there is an overlap between federal, state, and local concerns, that's a perfect opportunity for things like a joint task force. All right, moving into criminal justice reform, it goes back to that three-tier system I talked about. You've committed a heinous and violent crime, which has left a victim scarred for life. Incarceration is the appropriate approach to that situation. You've created a crime where you've hurting someone. Maybe it's vandalism, maybe it's theft, maybe it's depriving someone of their savings account through uh, wire fraud or whatever else it might be. That's a situation where, in some cases, incarceration might be appropriate. In other cases, it might just have to do with custodial monitoring or probation because I want someone to be able to be in an environment where they, they can still engage in productive labor so they can work on restitution to their victim. And then finally, that third tier where we're talking about someone that has committed a crime but there was no victim created in the process. And I think in situations like that, especially when it's drug-related or addiction-related, more re resources would be better spent with things like addiction recovery as opposed to just incarceration, right? When it comes to the over-criminalization, one, one of the things politicians need to do while they're trying to reform everything else, reform themselves. Understand that whenever you pass a law, you are telling men and women in law enforcement to go out and use violence if necessary to enforce it. So you know what? Maybe some ideas are best left to the private sector. They're best left to people working in voluntary cooperation with one another in order to achieve a problem. Maybe government should focus on those areas, what I like to call involuntary human, inter human interaction. So when somebody has hurt another person, stolen from another person, intimidated another person, assaulted another person, that's an appropriate area for government government to step in, write laws in order to prevent and punish those things in order to deter them from happening. But we don't need to be, politicians don't need to be arrogantly trying to reorganize society every five minutes. Right? And then finally, pathway to expungement. Once we've actually uh, seen someone that has violated the law, but they have been rehabilitated, they have done restitution to their victim, we need to start looking at removing certain things from their criminal record. Again, not for the heinous crimes where violence has been committed and people have been scarred for life or, or killed or whatever. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about nonviolent offenses where a victim hasn't been created. I'm talking about nonviolent or nonviolent offenses where restitution has fully been paid and someone has been rehabilitated. Let's not hang that felony around them for the rest of their life. Let's create a situation where it's easier for them to re-enter society and take the rest of their life and make as much with it as they possibly can. And then again, count the crimes from Chip Roy is a great way to kind of rein in and get politicians to finally understand that they have a hand in corrupting the criminal justice system system when they engage in over-criminalization or putting too many laws on the books. That's just a couple of the different policy positions that I would support in law enforcement reform and in criminal justice reform. These are things that I will vote for when I get to Washington, D.C. These are things that we are working on to carry our own legislation in order to make sure that we are protecting our police, protecting our communities, and providing a pathway back for people that have violated the law, rehabilitated, to come back and re-enter society to be productive members.
Next, we're gonna go over some of the questions that you asked us on these various topics. All right, so this first question comes from Santiago. It has to do following the horrific murder of George Floyd. Uh, the In the Qualified Immunity Act was introduced in Congress and it's received support uh, from you know, both sides of the aisle. Uh, you see qualified, or ending qualified immunity is a great way of holding police officers accountable when they violate people's constitutional rights. Would you support ending qualified immunity? I think the first thing that's important to understand about this is qualified immunity was never supposed to protect officers that had engaged in negligence or abuse of power and violated someone's constitutional rights. It wasn't supposed to do that in the first place, but clearly there have been situations where I think qualified immunity has covered that. So I, I definitely think we need to reform it, but as I mentioned earlier during the uh, um, law enforcement reform section, there are legitimate reasons why you don't want a situation where every time a police officer does something, you don't want a situation where an attorney can try to manipulate or interpret it into something that it never was. And if you're telling a police officer that, look, you know, you have to carry out your duties efficiently and effectively in accordance with the law, there's no problem with that. Um, the real concern comes is you're a police officer. You get a call to a violent situation, armed robbery in progress. If you show up, in time and you stop that person and you have to use deadly force in order to stop them. You know, you, you don't want to be concerned about, am I now going to be taken to court and, and some attorney is going to try to, I mean, even if you're going to win your case, there's still the stress of that. There's still the concern that, you know, you could be punished um, when, when really you did everything correctly, right? And, and I think that is a legitimate concern because if that officer is sitting in that cruiser and they get that call, they're gonna make one of two decisions. I show up in time and I maybe prevent a violent situation or an innocent person from getting hurt, right? But now I, I run the risk of being dragged into court because now every single decision I made and sometimes in split sec decisions with a violent person is going to be heavily, heavily scrutinized. And I'm not saying it shouldn't be scrutinized, but right now if that officer is taken to court, the department is, is going to be the one that's sued, not necessarily that individual officer. That officer is now sitting there and there's no qualified immunity and they know they can be hauled into court for any reason. I mean, it's far easier for them to just get to the scene a little bit later. And yeah, now maybe there's someone was harmed, maybe someone was killed in the process, but they're far less likely to get sued over it. So I, I don't want to create that sort of perverse incentive that I think would actually materialize if we just completely got rid of qualified immunity in the first place. So definitely narrow the definition, make sure that we're not using it as something that protects officers who are negligent or abusive in their powers. Um, but I, I do think that there is a role for it under far more narrow definitions. And I, I hope that makes sense. So I hope that answers your question, Santiago. Uh, Donna asks, what will you do to stop the violence against police in our communities uh, by different or organizations that have come in and, and a lot of them, I mean, we've seen the organizations, right? We've seen groups that come in where you'll see a peaceful protest taking place and then all of a sudden a, a few people, they're like almost professional protesters, they're professional agitators, they hijack a peaceful protest and turn it into something violent, right? I think there needs to be very, very strict penalties for that because not only are they engaging in violent activity or destructive behavior, uh, but they're also creating a situation where it makes it harder for other people to exercise their First Amendment rights in a peaceful way. And so I do think there needs to be harsh penalties for those people that go beyond peaceful assembly, go beyond protesting, go beyond even peaceful civil disobedience. I'm not talking about peaceful civil disobedience, but when someone is clearly engaging in a violent act or destructive act, I, I think that's different and that needs to be separated from those people that are engaging in peaceful protests. And I think the, the penalties uh, need to uh, correspond appropriately. Um, and then uh, Martin asks, uh, how do we get control over LeVar Stoney and return Richmond to the rule of, of law? So LeVar Stoney is the mayor of Richmond. He's engaged in a lot of activities lately, whether it's hamstringing his own police force or um, you know, removing statues and things like that completely in violation of law. And he just seems to get away with it. And, and again, one of the ways that we ensure that the laws applied equally across the board is politicians also have to be held accountable. You saw this with Senator uh, Lucas, who actually encouraged and, and uh, to some degree engaged in the, in the tearing down of a monument that ended up falling on somebody and hurting them. And from what I understand, that person is still dealing with significant medical uh, consequences as a result. 
I, I think politicians have to be held accountable for what they do. When they are violating the law and it is leading to violent or destructive behavior, they have to be held accountable. Politicians are not above the law. As a lawmaker, you should be held to a higher standard, not a lesser one than the constituents that you serve. And so there has to be real consequences for actions when politicians are engaging in clear violations of the law or illegal actions. So I hope that answers your question, Martin. Again, I want to thank everyone for joining us for this podcast. Again, if you have any questions about criminal justice reform or you want to look ahead to some of the other issues that we're going to be tackling over the next several weeks, we're going to be talking about COVID. We're going to be talking about education. We're going to be talking about foreign policy, the economy and jobs, health care. If you have questions that you would like us to address, either uh, within the overall discussion that we have or at the end when we answer specific questions from the audience, please go to podcast.nick4va.com and you'll see on there there's a schedule button. You can click on that. You can post questions there. Uh, we also have information for you on the show notes page on how to get us your questions so that we can make sure that we effectively address them through our podcast. Look, this is for you. We want you. We want everyone out there um, to understand exactly where I stand on the issues. I want to explain my reasoning behind what I identify as the problem and how I identify the proper solution, whether it's the government taking more of an active role or in many cases, the government getting out of the way and uh, ceasing from causing problems in the first place. But again, your questions make this a, a much more richer experience because now we're addressing the things that you as constituents, you as citizens are really concerned about. So once again, thank you very much for joining us here today as we addressed issues of law enforcement reform and criminal justice reform. We look forward to seeing you next week as we tackle another very important issue. And again, we will continue to do this all the way up to November 3rd, which is election day. Um, and I, I encourage Abigail Spamberger, my opponent and the incumbent Democrat, I encourage her to do something similar. Right? This, is, this should not be a personality contest between Abigail Spanberger and myself. This really should be a debate about the ideas and allowing people to look at where you stand on issues, where you stand on the tough issues, the controversial ones. How would you address them? What policy positions would you put forth so that everyone can make an informed decision on who would best represent them in Washington, D.C.? I'm Nick Freitas with Making the Argument. Again, please, if you have any other questions, go to nick4va.com. Under our podcast, you can ask those questions. And if you get around to it, please please leave us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts. You can listen to us on Spotify, but the more reviews, the more interactions that we get, the higher it goes up and the more people can have access to this program. So once again, thank you for joining us and we'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.